Gathered to worship you, to be instructed by your word, to fellowship with one another, to be an encouragement, as well as be encouraged. We thank you for your continued blessing in our lives, meeting our needs, giving us strength, giving us opportunity to be a testimony to your grace and your forgiveness and your love. We thank you for all these things. May our time together truly lift you up. May your spirit have freedom 
to work in our hearts and minds, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Healing Weekend is it's just another way of feeling heaven coming into your heart. It is so worth every penny and, and life-changing. So I would just tell them to dive into it if you're feeling apprehensive about it. When you are hurting, stuck in your pain, frustrated or discouraged, one of the best things that you can do is attend the Healing Weekend. Brian and I will lead you through proven healing steps, the same ones we use personally and that we have taught in the Healing Journey class since 2001. These same steps have led thousands of men and women to freedom. It is a proven path. While the weekend will never duplicate what you get in the class, it is the next best thing. Not everyone can attend a Healing Journey class, so we offer an impactful healing event that anyone can come to. An event that will speed up your healing process by months, if not years. Weekend intensives like the Healing Weekend can easily cost three to $5,000, but we offer this at a fraction of that so anyone can afford to come and receive healing. The Healing Weekend is just as effective as intensive therapy weekends, if not more. Your registration includes room and board, teaching from me and Cindy, safe and confidential small groups led by trained facilitators, and all of your materials. It has been an amazing change um, to myself and to my family already in just a couple of days. It's been amazing. It wasn't as scary as I thought it was going to be when we got here. You know, it will equip you to deal with those emotional events that will happen in your future and it would step you through and would actually complete the process at each circumstance. Brian and Cindy presented in such a um, down-to-earth way that it'll help us to learn how to give that away to other people too. Here's what the Healing Weekend offers. For a little bit of your time and money, you can truly be changed and receive healing. It's not just for other people, it's for you too. Join us at our next Healing Weekend we would love to meet you and see how God is going to change your life. For details, go to our website, hishealinglight.org. Hello again. Um, I always think it's a great idea to come up here and speak until I really do it. Anyway, <laughs> so this is their promo for their Healing Journey Weekend, which is in Colorado, and it is a stay there for the whole weekend and, and stay in a retreat. We're kind of modifying that, so ours here will be um, a Thursday night, all day Friday, and all day Saturday, so that's the condensed version. You will not stay here at the church, um, but you can let any family, friends, um, anyone else you know um, who might be interested pass along the information. We have put flyers out on the table. Um, I am the person you would talk to about uh, registering if you want to. Registration will be open through um, Sunday, the September 4th, and then we have to solidify the plan so we know how many people will be here. We probably only have room for about 16 ladies, um, and we have put the word out to a couple of other churches. Um, I just wanted to give you a quick rundown. Some of you have been through the healing journey and some of you have known me for a long time and you know a lot about me and some of you don't know anything about me. Um, but one thing I can say is that I took the healing journey for the first time, the whole 29 week version, um, oh, about 12 years ago, I guess, after my husband decided he didn't think being married to me was the right thing for him anymore. And that was a huge event, as you can imagine. But there was other childhood trauma and things that I also was carrying around, which impacted how I reacted to that situation. So I just want to say that going through the healing journey itself has really changed my life and helped me to be more centered in understanding how Christ can heal me, how um, I had some false beliefs and misconceptions and lies that I was believing about how I could be in charge of my own life or fill the voids in my life in some other way other than Christ. And so all of those have been 
greatly improved and life still is turbulent and crazy and has circumstances I'm not expecting and don't enjoy sometimes, but I can have a peace and a joy through those that I would not have attained any other way. Well, I hadn't anyway. So this is uh, definitely worthwhile. I, I realize it's a commitment um, that seems like a lot, but if you're struggling with some stuff, it really could help you. So if you have any questions, let me know. If you're interested in registering, grab a flyer from on the table and um, talk with me. Okay, thanks. That's just one of many things that are going to be happening over the next month or so as things begin to ramp up. Awana is starting on September the 12th. Um, in the bulletin is listed everything. I, on top of my head, I don't, I don't have it in front of me. Let me encourage you, this week's bulletin has a listing of stuff that's happening over the next month and a half. Um, so pay attention to that. I can't say everything will be accurately printed week after week after week. But next week is Sunday School Promotion. We're promoting kids. We want to invite you to be here at 10 a.m. in the auditorium, everybody here. We're going to do some special things related to prayer. We're excited about that. And then we're going to end off Sunday School with Sundays, ice cream Sundays. It's never too early to eat ice cream. We'll be serving those downstairs. You are welcome to have a Sunday. You're welcome not to have a Sunday. There'll still be coffee if that's what you want at 10, 15, 10, 30 in the morning. But we're going to be doing that next Sunday, 10 a.m., we're excited about that. Tonight, if you have any interest in what happened to the earliest believers in the first and second century, come tonight to see part one of a two-part video called Polycarp. It is the story of Polycarp. It is done as a drama in actual characters. You will enjoy it. Uh, he is one of the founding church fathers and faced some of the earliest persecution. You'll enjoy that. We'll be watching about 40 minutes of that video tonight and about 45 minutes of that video next week as we examine what God has done throughout the centuries. Our call to worship comes out of Psalm 147, verse 1. Praise the Lord. It is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and praise is beautiful. Let's continue that with the song, Wonderful Words of Life. Sing them over again. Wonderful words, wonderful words, wonderful words. 
<laughs> I was going to say that song that speaks about our Redeemer really points us to where the whole story concludes in Revelation chapters 21 and 22. We're in 21 verses 5 through 8. That's our scripture reading. May I invite you to stand for the reading of God's word. As you guys are standing, um, I just want to say that if you guys don't think that God has a sense of humor, I'm here to tell you that God giving me this verse once again. Um, for those of you who don't remember, I butchered one particular phrase in this verse. Um, I apologize if it happens again. Um, so carefully read the word. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write for these words and true, are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, <laughs> abominable murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. In verse 6 where he says, he will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to those who are the overcomers. The song we're going to sing, we'll remain standing for it, is Jesus is all the world to me. Only he can provide all of that. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy. Kids up here, we'll talk about what can you make. You guys, figure everything out. All right, I brought something with me, I'll pull it out in a minute. What would you, how many of you guys have ever made anything? You've made anything? You've, you've made something, you don't even know you made something. What could you make with a stack of blocks? What could you make? You could make a what? You could make a mess with a stack of blocks. Well, okay, that's very creative. What could you make that be, be a little more organized? You could make a tower. What else? You could make a house. You can make a castle. You can make a train. Interesting, how are you going to make the wheels? That, that'll be a little more difficult, the wheels. You could cut now. See, now you're getting much more creative. Well, let's move away from blocks to something. I was going to bring some with me. What could you do with Lego? Make a house. You can make a city. Oh, is that what you were going to say? A car. A boat. Okay, a big rig, a castle with walls. You can make a giraffe, a Jeep. You know, you can make almost anything with Lego. I mean, you can make a starship that flies across the galaxy. 
I don't know if it actually does. I mean, you can make a palm tree. I've seen life-size vehicles made out of Lego. They make full-size. Yeah, it's like thousands of pieces, takes thousands of hours. You do all sorts of stuff. So Lego allows you to make. Now, I brought one more thing with me. I hope nobody gets offended. I'm going to put this on the communion table. But, uh, all right. I, bought, I brought a bucket full of sand. It's not quite wet. What could you do with wet sand? You could make a what? A castle? Doors, okay. You can make a wall. Balls. What? A spaceship. Now, let me ask you, all the things you want to make, where'd you get your idea? Where'd you get your idea? From your head? Just thought it up yourself? Or have you seen it someplace else? On TV? I mean, there's people who carve things in sand. They make amazing things. They do them on the beach. They do them at fairs sometimes. See, up in, uh, I think it's in, in Syracuse, they, think, they make things out of butter. Don't they make a big sculpture out of butter? Yeah, and then everybody comes with toast, and they wipe it until the butter's gone, and that ends the fair. Everybody comes with bagels and toast, and the butter's gone. I don't know what they do with all that butter. I don't think. I've seen things carved out of chocolate. Well, let me ask you this. If you could make anything, I'll just, shh, look at me. If you could make anything at all, what would it be? If you could make anything at all. Boy, you guys really think about this stuff. A Star Wars ship, a real one. That you could fly to the galaxies in, okay. You'd make a box? Uh, that, says, that doesn't see you. Anybody make anything, what? An airplane. Now, what would you need to make an airplane? Stuff. Anybody got a pile of stuff? This young man's going to make an airplane out of it? I don't know. The Wright brothers, when they built the first airplane, they started with a bicycle. They started with a bicycle. They were bicycle makers. And then they did a study of wings and gliders. They developed the glider. They thought they'd attach it to a bicycle to see something to get movement. They had to turn a propeller. I don't know how they figured it all out. But they were, like, they were like smart guys. They did it all in Dayton, Ohio. That's where they did it. And then they went down to North Carolina, Kitty Hawk, and they flew a plane. It takes a lot of stuff to make things, right? Now, how did God make the world? Anybody remember the Genesis 1 story? How did God make the world? He said something? He said, so he said, let there be light. Let there be let there be stars, let there be land, let there be water, let there be... He did that for everything. He just said everything and it was all created. Is that how the story goes? Did God create everything by just speaking? Ah, there you go and came back to the bucket of sand. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, starting at verse 7, that he formed man out of the dust of the ground, which would be like sand formed him, and then it says he breathed into him the breath of life, and he became a living being. So man didn't stay as a sandcastle. He then, the sand became skin and bones and blood and organs, and he started breathing. And are we able to do that today? Make people? The way God made people? No, we can't make people. So God made everything out of nothing, and then out of the nothing, he made you. And you, and you, and you, and you, he made you out of nothing. The Bible says at one point, we're going to go back to the dust, and then he's going to make us again. Yes. He says, from dust you came to dust you return, and then he resurrects everybody, and he gives them a body all over again. Do you think the body will look exactly like you look today? I'm hoping not. Not that I don't like what you look like, but I know what I look like, because this last week, for the first time in many, many years, I looked in a mirror. And it wasn't a pretty sight. So I'm hoping that when I'm made new, I'm made better, and that's what we're going to talk to your parents and grandparents and family about. And those of you who need to go to junior church, why don't you go to junior church?
a little vacuuming will be needed up here. I'm just mentioning that. Oh, and uh, right there, too. Sorry about that. I don't know how many of you ever do an internet search on your phone or on your computer, but if you were to take a few moments to do an internet search of the great crises facing the world, each site you would find would present its own unique list. What are the great crises of the world? I did one of those internet searches. I'm just gonna mention a couple of those places that I found. One of them was called rescue.org. Rescue.org lists those nations whose people are at grave risk because of violence, famine, and disease. So rescue.org is an organization that, that targets to help nations where the people are at risk because of violence, famine, and disease. Most of those places are in East Africa. As they've looked at the globe, they went, what are the greatest crises in the world? Where should we look? They look at the Sudan, Syria, Somalia, Congo, Myanmar, Nigeria, Yemen, Ethiopia, and Afghanistan. That's in descending order, from the 10th worst to the worst. Let me read it again. Sudan, Syria, Somalia, Congo, Myanmar, Nigeria, Yemen, Ethiopia, and Afghanistan. Rescue.org in 2022, they have seen, they've looked at the world, and for them, where they're focusing, now, they're not focusing their energy on the whole world. They admit right up front. We're looking at really one section of the world, and we're listing the greatest problems, and then they mention in their website what they're attempting to do to try and help in those situations. I think some of those places have had the issues of violence, famine, and disease for a lot longer than Rescue.org has even been an organization, longer than the internet has been the internet, and maybe longer than maybe many of us are alive, and the situation still exists. Now, a second organization I saw was World Vision. You've probably heard of World Vision. World Vision describes circumstances in the world in terms of other, they don't talk in terms of national boundaries or people groups, they talk about circumstances. Here's their top five. Here are the top five. Number one, the worst crisis circumstance in the world today is food insecurity, of which they claim there are 50 million children malnourished. Worldwide, that number seems small, 50 million. But they say food insecurity. These are people who are not sure they will be fed, are not sure there is food to eat. Their second problem, second greatest problem, is refugees. 80 million people in the last year have fled their homes. 80 million people have left their homes because of violence, famine, disease, the things that are going on in their country. Number three, climate change. And here's what's interesting. They declare that climate change is causing both droughts and floods on their website as you read through some of the details of the things they're saying. So number one, food insecurity. Number two, refugees. Number three, climate change. Number four, child marriage and female discrimination. The fourth greatest problem in the world is child marriage. Girls 10, 11, 12, 13 being forced to get married. Female discrimination where women have no control over their lives in many nations around the world. We would not disagree that those are issues that are happening in people's lives. Number five, the fifth greatest problem, according to World Vision, is child labor and child trafficking. Child labor and child trafficking. Those are the five greatest problems they see the world facing, the greatest crisis. Now, who can fix those massive problems? Whether you look at rescue.org, whether you look at World Vision, whether you look at 100 different organizations and their websites, whether you look at studies being done by universities or, or, or uh, governmental groups like the United Nations, who can fix these massive problems? Who can stop the wars? The League of Nations was developed after World War I to stop all wars. Then there was World War II. Now the United Nations has come along and as the war stopped, right after World War II was the Korean conflict. Then we had the Vietnam War, at least we called it a war, and now we've been peaceful ever since. Who can stop the wars? Who can house the refugees? So 4,000 refugees get, get mailed by bus to a city of 7 million, and a mayor declares we can't handle it. And another mayor, another governor says, well, we have, and we're tired of it. 
Who can house the refugees? 80 million people move across boundaries, leave their homes to go to a new place. How many people are welcoming them in? How do you meet their needs? Imagine if a thousand children moved into Trumansburg in the next three months, what would the school do? They would either have to have all their teachers teach 16 hours a day and run school twice, because there's about a thousand students over there, maybe a little less. I don't know what the school would do. But that's the, that's the crisis we're talking about. Those are the kind of things. So who can house the refugees? Who can combat the consequences of weather disasters? So a big flood down southeast in Kentucky. I think it was Kentucky. Big flood down there. A flood that wiped out, uh, that stranded a bunch of people in the Mojave Desert. All the destruction that's happened over in Yellowstone National Park. Good thing they were not well-occupied people. Floods all over, disasters. We're just coming into the rainy season in a lot of areas of the world. The hurricane season is coming in. Who can combat the consequences of that? How long has it taken New Orleans to rebuild after the flood, the hurricane? Who can protect children and treat them justly? I mean, who can do it? Can we go into a nation and, and make them outlaw child marriage? You're going you're gonna to accomplish that? When can we expect a solution? So I went to a, a website to say, can we, in this whole area of the study of crisis, it says, so who's offering a solution? Here was an interesting one. The World Economic Forum claims that the Great Reset, a new social contract, can be built that will honor the dignity of every human being. Now that sounds wonderful, doesn't it? We're going to create a world in which every human being is honored, from children, to refugees, to, to, to people who have suffered a climate disaster. We're going to honor the dignity. Nobody would disagree with that idea of honoring the dignity of all people, right? The question is, how do you do that? How do you honor the dignity of all people? Well, according to John and the vision he's given by God in Revelation, according to John, the world's problems will be fixed, all of them when there's a new heaven and a new earth. It is interesting that God decides not to fix everything, but to replace everything. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, the second part of that verse says this, there'll be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There should be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. When God sets out to fix all the problems of the world, he simply makes it all new. So when I said to the kids, you know, we're made out of dust, and we go back to dust, they didn't like that idea, go back to dust. And sometimes we're a little leery about what we might say to children about death. And then we don't talk about death. Well, we don't live in a, we live in a very sanitized culture. We want to keep everything sanitized, though the Internet puts everything out there and is non-sanitized. We want to keep kids sanitized that. Maybe it's good if a child has a pet and the pet dies, and you see what death is. I don't know. I was never a kid who had a pet that died. We killed some things. Okay. They were called snakes. They were horrid. I spent three days trying to capture my friend and I, when we were seniors in high school, a squirrel under a falling rock. You put a rock on a stick, you took a string to it, put some food there. We tried for three days to crush a squirrel. We never managed to do it. They are way too fast. That's been my exposure to death. Who is able to fix everything? According to Revelation chapter 21, verse 5, here's the answer. Revelation 21, 5. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Who's able to fix everything? The one who sits on the throne. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Who's able to fix everything? The one who sits on the throne. In this verse, he says, I'm able. He declares his ability. What is the world's solution to climate change? So I did a little search. What is the world's solution to climate change? I want a delineated list. I want to know how we're going to fix the climate problems. Here was the answer on one of the websites. Number one, eliminate fossil fuels. Number two, eliminate anything needing fossil fuels. Their statement was, leave the fossil fuels in the ground and don't create anything that needs them Number three, this was the best one, eat vegan. 
This is a legitimate site. This was the work, this is the, this is the Paris Climate Accord, okay? This is the one 130 nations signed on to. Eliminate fossil fuels, eliminate anything that needs fossil fuels, and eat vegan. I'm not sure on the whole vegan thing. I didn't read into it what it meant, but I think we're not allowed to have burgers anymore. But eat vegan. Number four, plant trees. Number five, don't touch the oceans. They went into great detail about don't touch the oceans. Don't take fossil fuels out of the oceans. Don't overfish. They said basically leave the oceans alone. Now, do you know that Alaska provides 60% of all the fish we eat in America is fished off of Alaska? I don't know how much that is, and I did a study on that, and we talked about that in some message, I don't know, probably months ago, how much fish we eat. But leave the oceans alone. And here was the sixth solution to climate change. Sixth solution. Stop consuming. Stop buying stuff. Stop wanting stuff. It's because you want stuff that they make stuff and they make it in a way that's killing the climate. Now, I just, a, a couple, of, couple of things in here that seem to fall through the cracks. What about all the people who make a living and survive by making things we consume and producing meat that we eat? Just asking. And the people who work in industry. I mean, if you shut down 25 or 30 percent of the economy, how many people die? There's a really interesting book that was written a couple of years ago. It was a, a scenario of if the electricity was shut off in America completely, the grid was taken down, which it's vulnerable, 80 percent of Americans would be dead within six months. 80 percent of us would be dead in six months because there'd be no water and no food. No water and no food if you lose electricity. So it sounds good that you're going to honor all people, right? That the world says we're going to honor all people. It sounds good that we're going to fix a global problem of the weather is, is in upheaval. But when you look at some of their solutions, you go, really? Here's what Jesus says. I'll make all things new. It's broken. Genesis chapter 2 says it's broken because of sin, Genesis 2 and 3, I'm going to make all things new. We're just going to clean the slate. So God declares his intention. The world will be made new. And he declares his record. That's what he says in this verse. Write these things because my record is true. I did it once. I can do it again. We get to the end of the book, the end of the Bible. And Jesus declares, I'm the beginning and the end. As we get to the end, I'm telling you, I did the beginning, I can do it at the end. I can make all things new. I can fix all of this. Everything that's broken. He declares that his record is true. What records exist for the creation of the universe? I thought about that. So God has given us a record of how the world came into being. What other records do we have? What other written records? Apparently, we have 5,000 years of written records. That's what we have. Everyone will agree we don't have anything written prior to about 5,000 years ago. That was like the earliest writings. That was the earliest record. And those records would be a writing of the oral traditions people have told. I mean, where did they get their information? Somebody told them a story, who told the story to another, who told the story to another, and somebody finally says, hey, let me write that down. That's a great story. And they says, well, what do you mean, write it down? And then somebody figured out, this will mean this, this will mean this, and let's write it down. And they created an alphabet, they created a vocabulary, they created a language, and that's how we have language. And we have four, five, six, seven, eight thousand languages in the world today. Somebody wrote it down. Somebody wrote the first record. Well, what other records do we have? According to secular man, man who doesn't believe in God, the record is the Big Bang, millions of years of evolution, that record was written in the late 1800s. In the late 1800s, less than a couple hundred years ago, someone decided they knew how the world came into existence. They ignored 4,800 years of written record and created a new written record, starting with Charles Darwin, not the first, but he was the first to make it popular, wrote down and said, here's how the world began. And from that point on, men have gone, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. No God, here's how it all came to be. And they've spent years and thousands of hours and millions of dollars to write a record that says, here's how we came about. That's secular man. 
what about all the other religions of the world? So I did a little search on the religions of the world. How do they think it all came about? They all declare a creator, the religions, whether you go to Islam, whether you go to Mormonism, whether you go to Hinduism, whether you go to Jainism, they all declare there's a creator. They just describe the creator and the creative act in different terms. Some with detail, some without any detail at all. The Bible, I set the Bible aside from religion. You got secular man who doesn't believe in God, then you have religion, people who believe in a God, and then you have the Bible that declares there is one God. There is one God, he's the almighty God. He spoke everything into existence except man whom he formed particularly and specifically gave him life because he said man would be in my image. So the Bible is pretty specific in its creation story. At what point should the world make a serious inquiry into the records of creation and the evidence that may support them? Imagine if the world decided to, or to, to develop a forum, gather a committee and say, we want you to examine all the records of creation, all the records of how we got here, and then I want you to look at all the evidence we can find and see which one is the most likely. Well, a couple of organizations have done that, but they're creation organizations. They've done that work and said, guess what? The Bible account is the one that the evidence supports. But we don't live in a world that wants to know the truth. And so Jesus says, my record's true. So let's just look at the world's ability to solve the problems. How successful have we been at fixing global problems? One of the global problems that I thought was an issue, but nobody else seems to say, is overpopulation. I did some work on reading about overpopulation, and apparently, apparently we're not in dire need of overpopulation. You go back 20 years ago, they were saying we had too many people when there was 5 billion. Now there's 7.7 .7 billion. Now the, now the scientists are saying, well, the Earth can handle 10 to 11 billion. America could handle a billion people easily. They said in this one research I was reading that right now we produce enough food in America that without importing any food from anybody else, we could, we could add 100 million people to our population. We're just over 330 million now. We could go to 430 million and not bat an eye and feed everybody at the level we feed them now. That's not talking about how much land we have, that's just talking about how much food. And one of the arguments they made about, well, we'll run out of food, he says, if there's more people, we'll simply plant more food. There's more land available to plant more food, we'll just plant more food, we'll grow more food, we'll feed more people. But here's the solution to overpopulation. So I read a couple of articles on how do we, how do we prevent overpopulation. We empower women to say no to children. That was the solution. Empower women to say no to children. And they went back to the argument that a lot of kids, 13, 14, 15, are being put into marriages. They're getting pregnant. They're having babies and dying. Now there's a baby without a mother to take care of them. And so we got all these babies, and that was the solution. Let women say no. Makes for a great bumper sticker. But does it actually solve the problem of 1.3 billion people? in China, 1.1 billion people in India. Does that solve the problem? Just let the women say no. So I thought about disease. Since 1900, the world has suffered at least 13 major health crises. These are considered worldwide crises, in which COVID-19 was the second worst. Spanish flu was the worst. 50 million people died. COVID-19 was second. Six million people died worldwide. And in between are crises that killed anywhere from 800 people to 8,000 people. The Ebola crisis, things like this. Of those 13 major crises, how are we doing? At solving health crises. Well, we know the next pandemic's around the corner, right? So we actually aren't. So the world presents themselves as able to solve problems. What we find in this text in Revelation 21 is, God says that the one who sits on the throne will make everything new. Well, what are his credentials? What gives him a right? How does he seem to have the power to do this? What we find here is the world honors degrees. 
Here's how we know a person is able to solve our problems, because he has a degree. He has a PhD from a certain school. He's done his graduate work in certain areas. You know, so if a person's gone to Harvard or Stanford or MIT, if they've achieved a PhD, then they need to be heard, because they're some of the smartest people on the planet. The world honors those degrees. They honor experience. This guy has 35 years in his field. You ever met a person who's been 35 years in a job and they still don't do it right? You can have the wrong answers for 35 years. Just because you have 35 years of being stupid doesn't mean that we should listen to your 35 years of experience. Don't hire me to do your sheetrock mud, even though I've been doing it for 30 years. Because I'm still not very good at it. A lot of it's because I just don't care. The credentials that the world looks at is experience. So we look at a college campus and they say, we have 3,000 years of experience in our faculty. Yeah, 3,000 years of being wrong. Or a thousand experts say. You remember there was that 52, I think it was 52. I may have the number wrong, 50, 52. 52 intelligence experts who just a couple of years ago said there's no way that piece of technological hardware is bad. I'm not going to go into more details than that. But there was 52 experts. Now over two years they found ah, they were all wrong. Why doesn't somebody publish all their names and say you're an idiot? You were wrong. Were you just stupid or did you lie? I mean, you know, really, we're talking about credentials. We live in a world where politics is, do you believe anybody? Or is everybody willing to say anything or to get your support? And do they say, well, I'm going to fix this, but they really can't fix this. I get tired of politicians saying, when I get into office, I'm going to fix this. And then they go, well, you know, we got here and it's a lot harder than I thought. Why don't you just say, this job's impossible and I'm willing to wade into the swamp of impossibility? And I'll be your representative in a place where we're going to get nothing done, but I'm going to shout for you every day. At least you'd be more honest. When a person comes to me for help, for counseling, I tell them right up front, I can't help you. I can't help you. I mean, maybe I could help you. Maybe you need a dollar, I can give you a dollar. I can give you advice, but if the advice isn't particularly accurate to your circumstances or you don't take the advice, I can't help you. I'm willing to talk to you. I'm willing to share my experiences, what God has done for me. I'm willing to share what God has to say, but I can't help you. I can't fix this. We can't fix the world. We can't fix its problems. We can't fix sin. God can forgive sin, but he doesn't fix sin. Do you know the difference? He can forgive sin, but he doesn't necessarily fix sin. He doesn't fix the consequences of sin necessarily. You live a sinful life. He doesn't necessarily wipe out all those consequences that come from that sinful life, but he forgives you, and he offers to give you a new life, a new creation. I mean, do we really want this place rebuilt, this world? I mean, there's nice things in this world, but I'm hoping for something a bit better when God makes it without sin involved. The world honors itself. It spends most of its time patting itself on the, on the back. You know, all the awards shows... They're all about the people applauding themselves. They call it peer-reviewed. They call it institutional history. We have a reputation and institutional history for being the smartest and having the greatest solutions. They give themselves prizes like the Nobel Prize. You are the most brilliant person ever to work in the area of medicine this year, or chemistry, or writing. And then they give scholarships called the Rhodes Scholarship. Here's the best thing. I love it when the world says, this is settled science. And the definition of science is, we're looking for answers to questions. So nothing can ever be settled. There's nothing settled about anything. We say there are certain laws because we've never seen them violated. But then we've never lived outside of the realm of where we live. So how do we know if that law applies on Pluto? Well, we extrapolate through math. Somehow we can look out into the galaxy, use math, and tell you everything about what's going on out there with math. I don't get it. But then I passed, chemi I passed calculus, but I didn't know why. I knew the method, and I got an A, but I don't know why calculus exists. Apparently there was a guy who developed calculus. How would you even develop something that nobody knows what it's for? 
How do you convince people that it has a value? I don't know, but we can look out in the stars and we can tell that there has to be living planets with life on them because we did the math. Well, tell you what, you come do the math for me and show me that I have a million dollars in the bank. Let's do the math that way. It'll be just as true, probably. We live in a world that says we can offer answers. But what does God offer as credentials? Look at verse 6. Look at these credentials that he offers. I, it is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the waters of life freely to him who thirsts. Here's what he basically says to John. I gave you a vision, John, of me making everything new. You want credentials? I gave you a video preview. You want to know what the movie's like? Watch the trailer. Because I took all the clips for the trailer out of the movie. I made everything new and I gave you a glimpse. Do you want to know what my credentials are? I've already done it. Now you could go back to, I've already done it in Genesis 1 and 2. He says, I am the beginning. Nothing existed until I came along. You try and answer the question, what happened before the Big Bang? And the scientists go, well, well, you know, you know, we haven't gone back there yet. Where did the first stuff come from? Well, well, you know, you, you don't have an answer. They should just say there had to be God who made the first stuff and then he left it for us to figure out. Why don't they just say it? Because they can't. They cannot say it. The last verse here, verse 8, talks about the ones who can't say it. They can't admit that there's a God. Here's what he says. He says, I'm eternal. I'm the beginning. I'm the end. Nothing exists apart from my intention and action. There'd be nothing here if I didn't intend to do it and I didn't do it. Nothing existed before I decided to make everything. There was nothing until I decided. I decided, if you want to use the word one day... That would be in our context, not his. But I decided to make everything. There was nothing and I made it all. And nothing exists apart from me making it. And I'm the end. Nothing will exist if I intend to end it. If I decide to just wipe it all out, you don't have a say. We walk through life every day knowing we have no control over what goes on. In Luke chapter 12, you don't have any control how tall you are. You can't change your height. You didn't get to determine what you look like, the parents you came from. Nothing exists after God intends to act. If he intends to wipe it all out, nothing exists after. Nobody gets to restart it. Now, Satan said you will be like God, knowing good and evil. What Satan didn't say is you'll be like God and can make anything you want. That's what we've extrapolated. We can not only fix every problem we face, we can create new things. Here's the question. Can you create anything out of nothing? Can you create anything out of nothing? You go home for lunch today. You open the cupboards, there's nothing in them. You open the refrigerator, there's nothing in it. You open the freezer, there's nothing in it. There is no roadkill in your driveway, just to cover everything. No roadkill in your driveway. No plants outside your house that are edible, meaning they're all poisonous. What are you going to make for dinner out of nothing? Now, the story goes, if you got a few stones and you got a bucket of water, you can convince other people to bring carrots and potatoes and meat and everything else. You have a wonderful stew. But you can't do anything out of nothing. Can we destroy everything? I thought about that. Can we actually destroy everything? Now, some people say we could destroy the planet. We could blow up all the nuclear weapons and destroy the planet. We could poison all the water and, and poison all the water. Well, we probably can't poison all the water. Probably if everybody on the planet tried to poison all the water, there'd still be water in the aquifers underneath the ground that you can't get to. How would you poison all the frozen ice and glaciers that are in the North and South Pole? I don't know how you'd get and poison all those and make all of the water poisonous. I don't know how we could do that. But let me expand it beyond the Earth because we're going to talk about the Earth and we're looking at secular humanism. We have to describe the entire universe. How many of you think we can destroy the sun? Just the sun. Just, just, just the ball of fire in our galaxy. Not in our galaxy, in our, what is it called? Solar system, solar system named for the sun, solar. Okay, so how many think we could destroy a sun? We've, cre we've created a weapon that we can send to the sun and destroy the sun. Not even science fiction has done that yet. Now, there was the planet killer in Star Wars that could destroy a planet. So maybe, considering the galaxy has billions of 
stars and planets. It would take a while to destroy the universe. In our arrogance, we think we can do things. God is the eternal source of existence when he says he is life. He can provide the fountain of life. He can choose to give life. Can we cure disease? Some would say, yeah, we can cure disease. Can we indefinitely extend life? Well, the best work in the medical field right now is the statement that we could extend certain people's lives to maybe 130 years. Maybe 130 years. That doesn't sound like an extension. That sounds like a lot of time needing nursing care. Where does this leave us? Verses 7 and 8 offers us a choice. There's a choice. Verse 7. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. This all things is everything that's new. So if God can fix everything and make everything new, he says you can inherit all that new stuff. You can be part of that whole new thing, the whole new heaven, the whole new earth. You can get that if you will overcome. The question is, what are we overcoming? We can choose to overcome the world's lies. At the beginning of this, he says, my record is true. If you're going to follow my record, you're going to deny all the other records. You're going to declare them to be lies. What are those lies? There is no God. What are those lies? We are God. What are those lies? We make the rules. What are those lies? We can do whatever we desire. That's the route we're going down. Culturally, our nation particularly, and other nations as well. There is no God. We are God. We make the rules, and we can do whatever we desire. It's coming out more and more as some of the very powerful and influential people have died. It's coming out more and more how wicked and evil they were. They hit it well, but as they increased in power and influence and authority, they used it to fuel their own evil and wickedness. We can choose to overcome those lies. We can choose to overcome the world's pursuits. The world pursues pleasure. It pursues wisdom. It pursues judgment. It pursues the opportunity to be God. If you look at that great reset as put forth by the World Forum, you'll find that the men in that group are powerful men who want to control everyone's life who think they know best. Well, all I know is the Bible says all men are sinful. All our, all our rags are filthy and wicked. And everything we pursue is self-serving apart from God. So when he says we can choose to overcome, we can choose to pursue God and his will. I will be his God. He will be my son. So we can choose to overcome all that the world leads us to or... We can choose to follow the world. That's what verse 8 is all about. We can choose the world's way. Notice what he says here, Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, and the abominable. Those are the three critical things here, the three things listed. When I first looked at this list, I went, cowardly? What in the world? How does cowardly fit? I mean, I just cursory was reading through this passage a number of times, and I went, I don't get it. I don't get it. Cowardly. I get unbelieving. And abominable is a, is a um, composite picture of pursuing everything that's wrong. But what does cowardly fit in? And then as I develop the message, and I work through this concept of the lies, where Jesus says at the very beginning, I am true and faithful, here's the record. And he says, you need to be an overcomer. Who's the one who's not an overcomer? The coward. The coward. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let's put it into context. We can cower to the world's elite, to the world's powerful people. We can accept their rules. We can accept their oppression. We can accept their influence. We can oppose it but remain too weak or too fearful to outwardly oppose it. We can allow the wickedness of the world to control the narrative to control the direction and never speak against it. You could be cowardly. 
Now, Jesus is putting this into a life context. There are going to be people who, out of fear, even if they think the world is wrong, they're not going to stand up to it. They're going to let it be. They may not wholeheartedly agree with it, but they're not going to cause a wave because they're fearful. They're fearful of what might happen to them. When you look at the first century believer, when you look at what Jesus said to the disciples themselves, he painted this picture very clearly. When we start this thing, when the world really hears what I'm all about, when you start to profess your faith in me, they aren't going to like it. And you're going to face really tough circumstances. So a believer today in Iran or Iraq who publicly professes their faith in Jesus Christ publicly, they face what the first century believers did. The story of Polycarp is the story of one of those believers. The story of Helena is the story of one of those believers. Justin Martyr is the story of one of those believers. The men who went to the Aka Indians is the story of some of those believers who took the name of God, the name of Jesus, to people who says, I don't want that. You try and get a job as a professor at an Ivy League school with a strong declaration of your faith in Christ and see where you get. Make a strong statement of your faith in Christ at Trumansburg Central School District and see maybe where you get. Become a science teacher at that school and tell the faculty you're going to teach evolution and creation from a scientific perspective and see if you get the job. The cowardly. Then there are those who choose to believe their lies. These are the unbelieving. The unbelieving are the ones who say, you know what? This sounds really reasonable. I think we all came from apes. I think it was all a big bang. I don't think there's any God involved in all this. That God, that's just a human manufacturer to oppress me. We live in a world filled with oppression, and they blame the Bible as the oppressing agent. There's no more freedom given to humanity, both men, women, and children, than in the Bible. The Bible declares that a woman can prophesy in the church. A direct message from God can come through a woman. I know that doesn't sound like oppression to me. But we can choose to believe the lies. We can believe atheism. We can believe humanism. We can believe evolution. We can choose to not challenge, but get along, go along to get along. He's saying, here's the choice you can make. And then finally, the third one there, abominable, is what covers the rest of the words here in this text. We can practice their abominations. When he says murderers, falling into that category is abortion. Abortion is genocide. It's genocide of unborn. It's saying there's a whole cast of people who have no rights and don't deserve to live unless I say they live. There was a statement of a very popular personality on, on television who made this statement in the abortion thing when Roe versus Wade was overturned by the Supreme Court, which didn't overturn abortion. It simply said, let the states decide how readily you kill children. Let's just be honest. What the Supreme Court said is we're going to let the states decide how readily you murder children. You murder them at this point or you murder them at that point. So here's this famous personality said, I'm the mother, I get to decide if my child lives. And they slipped up by saying my child. And then this person says, it's a choice between me and my child. But the person twice says, so when you abort a child, have you talked to the child? Because you're now admitting it's a person. That's the abominable. That's the world in which we live, the abominable. They're murderers. Do we think sexual immorality is going to stop at the level it is now, or is it going to expand into more wickedness the farther it goes unchecked? If one of the greatest problems in the world, according to the experts, is child marriage and child trafficking, do you suppose pedophilia which is the next level of immorality in our world, is not the same thing as child marriage and child trafficking. So a five-year-old can decide they're no longer a boy and now are a girl, and that's not abuse. 
to encourage that because we're heading down a road of sexual immorality that we've not yet experienced, but it's just a step away, a step away, a step away. So he says, are we going to choose to follow the world's abominations, like genocide, like immorality? And then finally, the last one that really falls into sorcery, idolatry, and liars is idolatry. The person who's a sorcerer says there's a source for truth, a source of power that is not God. Idolatry says, I'll give you a picture of who God is. And liars is the basis of all of those things they say. Because the person who's a sorcerer and the person who's an idolater is simply lying to you about what they're offering for your life. If there were sorcerers out there who could solve all the problems of the world, why have they not done it? Why has disease not been wiped out? Why didn't they step forward and wipe out the COVID-19 problem? If climate change is a big issue and sorcerers and witches have the ability to control the environment and the world, why have they not solved this problem? If the sorcerers and the idolaters have the solution, why have they not given us the information? See, what the world gives us is lie upon lie upon lie upon lie. So in July, there was 0% inflation, according to one prominent political figure. He came on and he says there was 0% inflation in July. No, there was a 0% increase in inflation. Inflation was still at 9 or 10%. And according to the CPI of, of groceries, it was at 13.9%. But he made the declaration there's 0% inflation in July. Because it's just a lie. It's a lie to make him, as the President of the United States, look better. It was our President who said that. You can go look it up and find it. Zero percent inflation is a lie. Because they just lie. Because we live in a world of liars, a world of abominable people, a world who, of people who want to believe the lie, and people who are too afraid to challenge the lie. And God says, flip it back for me one verse, if you're willing to overcome you'll inherit all things. Here's the point of this message. We're just going to do the one song to finish. The first song. I just mentioned the worship team. To overcome is to grasp that it is all God and nothing in me that if I don't put my complete belief, faith, and dependence on him, I am slipping down a slope of accepting the world. And if I slip far enough down the road of accepting the world, am I truly an overcomer? God declared to the disciples and to all who would follow that it is a journey you are on. It is not a moment in time where you make a commitment. It is a journey that you follow every day of your life. And in your journey, you should grow stronger in your faith. More sure of the truth. More more disgusted by the level of wickedness knowing that God will eventually make it all new. We won't solve the world's problems. We won't rid ourselves of sinful people who surround us. We will not rid all sin out of our own lives, but God will allow us to be overcomers through his truth so that he will declare, I am your God and you are my son. Dear Father, we thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. We thank you for the fact that Jesus Christ alone is the God who overcomes. And he did it on the cross. And he purchased our salvation. And now as we read this book of Revelation, we can see that it's not far in the distance that God, you will return. And if you don't return in our lifetime, that will not that will not diminish faith in you that will just strengthen our faith every day you give us until we pass into your presence 
Help us to live a life that shows that level of faith and commitment to you that is not swayed by the lies of this world but allows us to stand on firm footing and declare our allegiance and our commitment to your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. The song is called The Shout of El Shaddai. Can you hear it? Thunder in the distance when we worship the Lion of Judah. Keith, will you close in prayer, please?
putting lives that are putting others to the truth that are, are unchangeable. The will is the governor of the world. Absolute truth 